We're going to talk about Easter. We're going to talk about the cross and the resurrection. And over the next uh, three Sundays, this one, the next two, and Good Friday, in those four messages, we're going to talk about the cross. We're going to talk about the resurrection. We're going to talk about what are messages for us right out of Scripture. Not my opinion, so to speak, but what does the Bible tell us? So why don't you open up your Bible to John chapter 14. We'll get there in just a minute. The very first words in John 14 are, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. As we even start today, I want you to think two key messages. Before we even dive into Scripture, I want you to just hear these couple of themes and messages to hear for us today. Here's the first one. God does not want his children, his people, those saved by his grace. He doesn't walk, want you to walk in worry and anxiousness and fear. In this translation, it says troubled. He doesn't want you in that state. I would guess that if I go around this room right now, or I can say it a different way, all of us, at some point in time, have struggled with worry, anxiousness, fear, being troubled. But I would also guess there's probably a pretty good crowd in here that's still struggling with it right now. And this passage reminds us, Jesus, don't let your heart be troubled. He wants us to walk in peace. You know what? you got your Bible open. You can already even look down there. I'm getting ahead of myself, but in verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. That's in John 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. That's the second time. And he even says, don't let it be fearful. That's what God tells us. Here's the second message he tells us. And it's a very, very, very important message. If you're a person that says, if I were to ask you, oh, what if my life ended today? Is my home in heaven? Am I saved by his grace? Is it clear to me that my life for all of eternity is with Jesus Christ? And if you say, I don't know, or no, or I'm not sure, I want you to hear this up front before we even dive into Scripture. Jesus is the one and only answer for you and your life. Please hear that. And I hear the amen, and that message right there on the screen is for every one of us in the room. Every one of us. And I'm going to explain that as we get deeper into our text today. But those two messages, don't be afraid. Jesus is the answer. I want you to hear that before we even walk out of here and get diving into Scripture. Okay? So open up your Bible to John chapter 14. Let me set the stage just a little bit on what it's telling us about. Now, I'll just tell you the key words of how it starts. It says, let not your heart be troubled. But I want you to get the context. Now, some of you know these stories. If you, you can flip around in your Bible while I'm talking. In John chapter 11, Lazarus has been dead and in the grave, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Y'all remember that, right? Or at least some of you do. And he comes out of the grave dead man, and now he's alive. Wow. I'd have loved to have been there to just see that. But you know what's incredible in that chapter? It says there were people that plotted to kill Jesus when that happened. Wow. If you've been here over the last few weeks, we talked about this. It said religion is very powerful. People can be so religious that they miss Jesus. And that's exactly what happened in John chapter 11. And in John chapter 12, you, some of you have heard the story. We sometimes celebrate it on Palm Sunday. We said Jesus' triumphant entry. Jesus goes in. People are yelling, Hosanna. One week later, they're going to say, crucify him. If you've got your Bible open, you'll see in John chapter 12. I'll flip over there, but I'll point you to a verse or two. In John chapter 12, Jesus says these words in verse 23. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he talks about death. And then he goes on a few verses over. He says there in, in verse 27, he says, Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose came to, I came to this hour. 
Look at a few more verses over. He says there in verse 31, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. He was speaking about his death. Now think about it. If you're a disciple, you're a follower of Jesus, you've been with him for three years. And Jesus says, hey, I'm about to die. And they're thinking, what? You just raised a man from the dead. And then Jesus does something that's one of the most beautiful things in Scripture. I encourage you over this Easter season, start in chapter 13 of John and read to the end of the book of John. John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus says, I'm just going to pull my disciples in with me, and I want them to know that I love them, and I want to prepare them for what's about to happen. Don't miss that picture. Jesus loves with an unbelievable love. And in John chapter 13, you can flip over there. He's now with the twelve. One of those 12 is Judas. One of those 12 is going to be his betrayer. Scripture says he knows his betrayer. An amazing thing happens in John chapter 13. I just told you Jesus loves. Get this. He washes the feet of all 12 of the disciples, even the guy that's going to betray him. Blows my mind. The disciples are shook. See, that task was for the lowliest of slaves. To wash dirty, stinking, smelly feet. Jesus did it. But if you got your Bible open in John chapter 13, he says, Oh, I got something else to tell you. One of you here around the table, one of you is going to betray me. Can you imagine? They've been traveling together for three years, and he goes, One of you guys is going to betray me. Imagine how that made him feel. Judas does slip out of the room. They still didn't connect the dots. Judas leaves. The Lord institutes the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, he's also referencing his death. If you go in John 13, there toward the end of that chapter, he says, now if you got your Bible, you might want to start looking at Scripture there and looking at John chapter 13. He says there in verse 33, little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. What? Jesus, I've been with you for three years. I gave up my life for you, and you're leaving me. You come down there to verse 36. Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you'll follow later. Peter, the bold one, says, Lord, Why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Now get that picture. If you go read all the accounts in Scripture, go read the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, here's what it says. Jesus not only says that, he goes, Peter, the devil has asked permission to sift you like wheat. And I gave it to him. Oh, by the way, the devil can't do anything unless the Lord gives him the authority. That's another message on another day, but you ought to follow it away. But what's he saying? Think about if you're in that room. You might have kind of nudged somebody and say, hey, Peter's a little bit crazy, but he's bold, right? I mean, they would have said, this guy is bold. And what did Jesus just say? The devil has asked me to let you be sifted like wheat, and you're going to deny me. That was a long introduction, but that's the context. That is the context. Jesus is leaving. Jesus is talking about dying. Peter's going to deny him. He's talking about the devil is asked to go work in his life. Oh, my goodness, what's going on? And Jesus speaks. In John 14, he goes, let not your heart be troubled. Wow. Hopefully you're by now in John 14, and hopefully you focus I tell you, we're going to look at key messages for us. And I want you to see this message right here. How does Jesus stop? Don't let your heart be troubled. But I want you to see something here that is critically, super duper important for us to grasp. Jesus says, I want you to not let your heart be troubled. He is giving comfort to the disciples. And he is reminding us, 
for my children, for my own, I love you. You're always in my care. All over Scripture. It's everywhere. Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Jesus says, cast your cares upon me. Jesus says, be anxious for nothing. Jesus even says, I haven't given you a spirit of fear there through, the, through Paul in 2 Timothy 1. He says, I've not given you a spirit of fear. In Isaiah, you can go back to the Old Testament. Do not fear in Isaiah chapter 41. But I want you to see that second sentence that's on the screen there in front of you. What's Jesus about to face? What's Jesus about to face? Jesus is about to face betrayal, rejection, pain, suffering, far beyond any of us, the magnitude we can imagine. Pain beyond what any of us have ever experienced. And then on top of that, he's going to take on sin, which he absolutely 100% hates. If you're a note taker, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, He who knew no sin became our sin for us so that we could become righteous. Jesus is facing every bit of that. And yet he goes, come here, my 11. Just, nope. we got to make sure my kids and my family are okay. Seven hours later, I think the story goes, something like that. He starts looking at his arm had been wrapped. Somebody pitched him a shirt. He needed stitching and sewing up and cuts on his body. You can relate to that story if you're a parent. You get it. That's nothing. Jesus knew what he was about to face, but he said, I love you. And I want to invest time for you to hear. He wants you to hear today. Don't let your heart ever be troubled. I'm your Savior. I love you. I care for you. And he puts the words there. What's the next words? You can read them. Do not let your heart be troubled. Look at your Bible. What's the next words? Believe in God. Believe also in me. The words there, now some of your Bibles might have slightly different words there, but here's what he's saying. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. He says, no matter what you're facing, you're facing financial problems, trust God. You're facing family problems, trust God. You're facing uncertainty in your life and a job situation, trust God. He says, it starts with believing in him. And oh, by the way, there's some theology here. Do you see it? He said, hey, you've been raised since you were this tall to believe in God. He said, I'm God. That's what that phrase is saying. He goes, you believe in God? You can believe in me too because I'm God. That's really what he's saying there in John 14, verse 1. So let's keep reading. I want to read now in Scripture, verse 2. Now, you just think about it. Your heart's troubled. Your heart's shook. Jesus has just said, believe in me. What do you think Jesus is going to say next? Can't you remember that I raised somebody from the dead? Can't you remember that I made the lame walk? Can't you remember that I made the blind to see? Can't... No, he doesn't. Look at what Jesus says in his next words that every one of us in this room need to remember. Verse 2. In my Father's house, or many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And he even says, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. If you don't have those three verses underlined in your Bible, I would tell you to underline them. They are some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful verses. He says, no matter what you're facing in this world, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he said, hang on to this. In my Father's house, in God's house, he's talking about heaven. They weren't, that didn't just phase them at all. They knew exactly what he was talking about. He goes, in heaven, there's a whole bunch of room. And the word there, some of you may have the word mansions there. But it really is the word room or dwelling place. And here's what he's saying. It's like a father building onto his house, and he's built all these rooms and all of this space. And he says, there's plenty of room. He said, you guys need to make sure you understand. Now think about it. They haven't seen the cross yet. They haven't seen the resurrection yet. 
They're sitting there going, what's going on? He's, he's thinking, oh, your world is about to be rocked. But he said, I want you to remember this. Heaven is big. My father. And he said, I want you to hear this. I'm going to prepare a place for you. What will you think if you hear that right now? Are you thinking like me the first time I read this? I go, what does it mean that Jesus has to go prepare a place? Is heaven in disrepair? I mean, does somebody need to go to heaven and start building some more rooms? Is there out of space? Is there some repair work needed there that it's been sitting around empty? And What does that mean, I go to prepare a place for you? Here's what it means. Simply put, Jesus hasn't been to the cross yet. Did you hear that? Jesus hasn't done the work where he can say, it is finished. He hasn't been there. Jesus hasn't been three days in the grave and rose from the grave victorious over death and fully paid for sin. But it's coming. It's real close. This is Thursday, you know, when he's talking. Within 24 hours, less than 24, he's on the cross. He's also saying, I'm going to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, and I'm going to be there interceding for you, just what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. And he says, I'm waiting for that moment one day, and he says, I'm going to come again. And he says, I go to prepare a place. Every person, every person in this room, if you're saved by the grace of God, you should have a smile on your face from ear to ear. And even bigger than that, because here's what he's saying. God, here's what he's telling the disciples. God has a home for you that's forever. God has a home for you that is always there. But it's only there because he prepared a place. It's only there because of the work of Jesus Christ. And if you're a person in worry and fear and anxiety, notice what Jesus says here. He says the solution Look heavenward. The solution, look to eternity. The solution, remember that you're going to live in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and then add another forever. I mean, you know, I mean, he's saying you're there. I don't think you and I, I know I can't. I mean, think about it. July 4th, 1776, we celebrate our independence. We think, oh, man, that's a long time ago. It's less than 250 years ago. And do you realize in heaven, 250 years will be like just, you know, not even a ripple in the ocean. It's the tiniest of pebble in time. <laughs> it's nothing. He says, that's what you have. And that's what he's telling. He says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. And I didn't read that one phrase. I should have emphasized it. What does he say? If it were not so, I would have told you. This is Jesus Christ saying that. He says you can book it as an absolute 100% fact. There is heaven, and it's all because he prepared a place. It's all because of his finished work of a cross. It's only, you're going to see that in just a minute, through Jesus Christ. But he's got another phrase in there I want you to see. If you got your Bible open there, he says in verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. He doesn't say sort of, maybe, kind of. He goes, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Wow, wow, wow. Listen, I'm going to give you just a moment here. Sometimes I'll put verses on screen, but I will want you to flip in your Bible. I hope you bring your Bible every week. Go flip in Hebrews chapter 9. Just go look with me for a minute. I want you to just see a couple of these verses. Hebrews chapter 9 is one of the beautiful chapters in the Bible that tells us verses like this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It tells us in Hebrews 9, for men is appointed to die once, and there comes the judgment. It tells us great doctrine. The very last verse in Hebrews chapter 9, look what it says, verse 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. 
for salvation without reference to sin. What's he talking about? Oh, he's not coming back to pay for sin anymore. He did that once and for all, and it's done and complete. He doesn't have to go doing anything else for sin anymore, but he is coming again, and he's coming for his saints, and he goes, he's coming to those who eagerly await him. We studied the book of Acts for the last several months. Y'all remember that? You remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 11? I won't have you flip there, but you'll remember. You remember Jesus goes up right before the eyes of the disciples. Y'all remember that? And what did he say? The angels go, hey, uh, you're sitting here with your mouths open, but just like he went up, he's coming back. All over Scripture it tells us. But I want you to go to one other passage. Go to 1 Thessalonians. Many of you know this passage. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes here to the church at Thessalonica. And here's what he says. I'm going to pick up 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 14. I got to get moving. I get excited about this. I'll keep talking about it. Verse 14, here's what it says. For if we believe, catch that, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming to the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, boy, verse 16, whoo, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now read it at the end of verse 17. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Did you catch that? Jesus over and over all through Scripture, he goes, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, he goes, oh, man, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. And he said, it's going to be incredible. People dead and in the grave, their souls with Jesus, but their body's going to be reunited in a resurrected state. And he said, those of us, maybe he comes today. It'd be okay, wouldn't it? That'd be awesome. But he says, hey, we're all going to be with Jesus, verse 17, always. Always, I have that word always double underlined in my Bible, be with the Lord. But look at verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Yes, we face things that might trouble us. Jesus says, just remember, I got everything in this entire universe completely 100% under control. There's not one thing out of my hands. Yes, there's the cross. Yes, there's the resurrection. Yes, there's a period of time where the church is here. And he goes, but one day I am coming back. And one day I will judge. And one day I will reconcile all things. And one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And yes, we should clap our hands on that. We should say glory to God on that. I must tell you, I'll probably... Please understand what I'm about to say. Sometimes, I, you know, I, I was born, and I'm, I'm sure three weeks old, my mother had me at church, and I've always gone to Baptist church. But, you know, sometimes I think we as Baptists, we're pretty formal. I mean, when we hear stuff like this, we ought to be going, glory to God. I mean, that is just amazing. What God is telling us here in Scripture, and I need to get back to the book of Acts. But he says in Acts, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself. Not Acts. Go back to the book of John. I'll get there. And, uh, and, you know, we could go back to Acts, but let's go to John right now. And in John 14, he says, I will come again and receive you to myself. Now, I just said it, but I want you to hear this. God's in control. There's not one thing for us to worry about. He's reminding them, think if you're a disciple. You're about to see me hanging on a cross. You're about to see me in a grave. You're going to go to a grave, but oh, you're, there's a day coming. You're going to see the resurrected Jesus. And he said, I'm just telling you, it's a, it's a picture to us. Don't let the moment get you discouraged. Trust in Jesus. He has it completely under control. We worry about today, but if we're saved, we got a home in heaven. 
And we need to rest in that. But don't miss one last thing. If you've got your Bible open, look at these words. Verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Verse 2, if it were not so, I would have told you. At the end of verse 2, I go to prayer a place for you. Verse 3, a place for you. And in verse 3, receive you. And in the end of verse 3, there you may be. Do you get the message there? He's saying the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is not just something we broadly talk about. It is a personal, whoops, it is a personal, personal relationship. He cares for us, and he reminds us it's intensely personal to him. Intensely personal. I want to make sure you get this. Jesus is coming. He cares for us. But then he says, you know the way I'm going. And Thomas, I really think sometimes we call him doubting Thomas. I call him honest Thomas. He kind of says what a lot of us are thinking, you know. And he says, Lord, what are you talking about? And Jesus delivers the quote, and I want you to hear this. Every person in this room, I don't care who you are. You need to get Jesus' response. He says, I am. And oh, by the way, if you're a student of the Word, you know that Jesus has used these I am statements all through the book of John. But this one, he goes, I am. Now notice, he doesn't say somebody else or me and three or four others. He goes, me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, this is the most absolute, one of the most absolute verses in Scripture, comes to the Father but through me. If you're saved, you ought to say hallelujah. If you're lost, read this verse a hundred times. If you're saved, we need to proclaim that verse over and over and over and over and over again. It is the gospel in a nutshell. I want you to hear it. I'm going to just talk about this verse for a minute, and we're going to try to digest how do we respond. But look how that verse is constructed. He says, I am the way. The word the way there means the road, the path. I'm it. You know, to get to Buena Vista Baptist, you come down Kennedy Bridge Road. We'd say, oh, there's only one road in. Well, but there's, you, we could get here different ways. You could parachute in, you know? I mean, you know. Uh, we've had a helicopter land right out here. You can helicopter in. Somebody could say that, come in back from the neighborhood behind us, and I'm going to walk to church, come in through the back roads here or through somebody's backyard. Why do I bring that up? We're pretty creative. We can find a way to get here. Jesus says, no, you can be as creative as you want. You can think of all kind of options that you want. He said, there's only one road, one way. That's it. You can try, and we do. We try to brainstorm everything under the sun. We think, oh, I can be good enough to get a he in heaven. There will be an exception for me. That verse doesn't say that. You can say it, but you're wrong. And, you know, there will be people that create religions. And they'll say, well, this religion, if I follow this religion, then I'm going to get to heaven. No, nope. you only can follow Jesus. That's it. And some people say, well, what if I'm sincere and I do my very best? God's going to know my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. He knows that we're desperately sinful and wicked. And it tells us that in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And because of that, we can only be saved through Jesus. Hear me. We go to church, but do we grasp this verse? He says, I'm the truth. He means there's not one ounce of anything here uncertain in me. It's a full, guaranteed, authentic way, the only way, certified by God Almighty, it is true. And the word life there, if you actually go look it up, he's really saying, I am the everlasting, true life. There's no other way to live. Because hear me, because if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're dead. Did you hear me? You're dead. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says we were dead in our trespasses and sin. It's as clear as it gets in Scripture. We're dead. So what does this verse say? Stay with me. No one comes 
to the Father. If you've never underlined it, if you've never read it, if you've tried to look for where it says, does it say no one except you or no one except a few people or most people come to the Father through me, does it say that? No. Jesus is speaking right before the cross. He's crystal clear. He goes, no one. And I want you to don't miss this. What does he use the word here? Comes to the Father. And what did he just said in verse 2? In my Father's house, heaven, or many dwelling places. What's he really saying? You're not going to heaven. You're not going to the Father in heaven except through Jesus. That's it. Now, you're probably, or like me, you've been in church many, many, many years in your life, some of you, and you go, I've heard that verse. No, I want you to digest that verse. That verse is as clear as a bell that a person does not go to heaven without Jesus Christ. The only access to God, the only way. Some of you have gone to places. You know how you got to go. I, I went and visited a place. John and Susie remember this. I, I was down visiting uh, down in uh, Palm Beach, and I wanted to go see this uh, kind of exclusive place there called the Breakers. And I wanted to go and uh, check it out. It's kind of a wealthy, ritzy kind of place. And I was like, I want to go see what this place looks like. And I went in, and then I wanted to go out to the pool area. They're like, you can't go. I'm like, well, I, I just want to see the place. You know why I couldn't go? You don't have a room here. You don't have access. You don't have a badge. And that's exactly the way it is in heaven. Unless we have the badge of Jesus, unless we have that access card of Jesus, we don't get in. We can talk and smile and be, you know, I tried being nice, you know, but it doesn't matter. You're not getting into heaven except through Jesus Christ. And in case I haven't been clear, he uses the word truth here. And he says, no one comes to the Father but through me. And what he's saying here is, if any person in this room and any person on this planet, if you think there's an exception for me, if you think, oh, I'll be okay, God makes it crystal clear on this verse. If you're thinking that way, you have been deceived by the devil. And the devil in John 8, 44 is the father of lies. And that's exactly the lie that is taught all over the world today is that surely there's multiple ways to get to heaven. Surely God even will send everybody ultimately to heaven. We say all kind of crazy, stupid stuff in our world today, but I'm telling you, the, wor the world is wrong. The Bible says there's one way to heaven. You got it? That's the message that we must hear at Easter. Jesus paid for our sin. And you might go, well, why is Jesus the only way? We're going to talk a little bit more about this in the next couple of Sundays, but I'll just say this. He's the only way because of sin. And when you really boil it down, our sin, you, 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 nobody in this room, you can't pay for my sin. You can't do it. I mean, I think you like me and I like you, but we can't pay for one another's sin. And we think, well, maybe I could do this. No. Sin is hated by God. And God says, when it says in Hebrews 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. It says sin is so horrible, blood has to be shed to pay for that sin. And in Hebrews 9, verse 14, he says, listen, he said the blood of bulls and goats in the preceding verses, he said it won't cover it. But in verse 14 in Hebrews 9, he goes, oh, but the blood of Jesus will. Amen? He says the blood of Jesus is the only payment. That's why Jesus is the only way. He's perfect. He had to be our payment on the cross. I want to ask you something. How do you respond to this? Here's how Paul writes about it. He said there's one God, God the Father. There's one mediator. Notice those words between God and man. One. Did you catch that? There it is again, absoluteness. And who is it? 
Jesus. And what did he do? He gave himself as a ransom payment. The only way our sin could be paid for, Jesus Christ. I've got four things that I want you to think about today. It's a message that every person in this room shouldn't walk out of here saying, oh, wow, guess that was kind of good to hear. No, it's important. How should we respond? Here they are. Number one, he starts off with, don't let your heart be troubled. He says, I want you to know if you're a child of the living God, if you're saved by his grace, he loves you deeply. He has given you a home in heaven. He has given you a home for all of eternity. You are never out of his care ever. If you were to read that whole chapter, he says, I am leaving, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit to reside with you for all of your time while you're here in your earthly body. And then you'll be with me in heaven for all of eternity. He says, the moment you're saved, you're in God's care forever. I don't even know that any of us can fully grasp that. But that's what he says. Trust him. I don't care what's going on in your life right now. If y'all remember our study in the book of Acts, remember we said God knows exactly where we are at all times. He knows. He loves you. Trust him. You may feel stressed out today. Cast your cares to him. Now, listen. He's telling the disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. Are the disciples going to go through a whole lot of trials in the rest of their life? Yes, they are. You see, God looks at that as just temporary light affliction, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, because we have heaven. Trust him. Number two, this is the non-Baptist statement, you know. Rejoice (laughs) if you have been saved by his grace. If you read those six verses, he says he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and he has given you access to the Father for all of eternity, and he is coming again to bring you into his own. And he even uses the words, to receive you to myself. Woo, that's beautiful. That joy should be evident in every one of our lives, night and day and day and night and eight days a week. I mean, you know, it should be, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. Our life should be a living testimony. Number three, I say that it's as sincere as I can and as direct as I can. If Jesus Christ is not your Savior, you have no hope except Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, that is a serious, serious statement on the screen. I want you to look. I did put a couple of verses there that I want you to see. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, this is right after the start of the early church. This is the disciples, Peter and John. And what are they proclaiming? They're saying the same thing he told them in John chapter 14. They said there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name that has been given among men, among mankind by which we must be saved. And Jesus speaks in his earthly ministry. He said, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But catch that next phrase. He who does not obey the Son. That's just another way of saying who doesn't believe in the Son of Jesus, the Son Jesus as your Savior. He says, they will not see life. And what does he say? The wrath of God abides. What a phrase that should scare the daylights. I don't even like reading it. It says the wrath of God that is ultimately displayed in hell. But it uses the word abides on him saying a person without Jesus that it abides on them. That makes me I mean, it it makes me sad. We should hear that verse. If you're hearing my voice right now and you don't know Jesus, the great thing is, Jesus does say, I was talking with someone yesterday, 
Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Number four, we got to proclaim. Every one of those 11, those 11 that were in the room with him in John chapter 14, guess what they did after the cross, after the resurrection? See, we know the rest of the story. What'd they do? We got to tell people about Jesus. We got to tell people they're lost. We got to tell people that there's only one way to heaven. We got to tell people. That must be us. That must be Buena Vista Baptist Church. That must be what we're about, is to proclaim the gospel to our friends, to our family, to people that are around us. To tell them, oh, let me tell you the most beautiful of stories, that Jesus is the answer. That's what Dylan and Isaiah are saying. I got it today. When they're sitting in my office, we must proclaim. Bow your heads with me. Lord, I just ask for your Holy Spirit, for you, to speak to every one of our hearts in this room. Lord, I pray that not one of us in this room, not one, is blind right now. I pray, God, that your Spirit speaks to our heart that we grasp that if we're saved, we should walk in joy and proclamation. But Lord, if we're lost today, I pray, is the day of salvation. God, I pray for your spirit to lead each of us. I thank you for grace. I thank you for the cross. I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you have been here before. If you're visiting with us today, we offer an invitation. The invitation, quite frankly, I was kind of looking around to see if there was somebody around me. I was kind of glad when I looked to my right there, Bill. And, uh, and uh, you know, we give an invitation, and uh, that invitation is really for you just to think about where's my life. If you're interested in being a part of this church, we'd love to talk to you about that. If you say, hey, I need to talk to someone about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, we absolutely would love to talk to you about that. You can talk to me after the service. Sometimes a person grabs me after church to talk. But here's the message. Don't ignore that. And thirdly, you just might say, hey, this is a time for me. I need to pray to the Lord and think about what I've heard today. I'd, I'd much rather you, quite honestly, bow your head and pray to him and me thinking about that and singing along. I just want you to think, how does God want me to respond as Bill leads?